Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucia Dolce, and uh, I'll be talking to you today as the convener of the MA Buddha Studies here at SOAS. Um, maybe I thought I'd say a few words about myself to start with. I'm um, a scholar of uh, uh, Buddhism, in particular East Asian Buddhism, and I'm currently the Numata Professor of Japanese Buddhism uh, here in the Department of History, Philosophy, and Religions. Um, I thought I would organize today's event uh, um, with a bit of introduction about what it means for the studies. And uh, then I'd like to give you an example um, drawing on my own research uh, on the topic that you'll see on the uh, screen, Buddhist bodies, uh, transience, and the performance of liberation. And I'll, uh, um, I'll make sure to leave a little bit of time at the end to speak a bit about the program, uh, since in previous years, uh, uh, students have been keen to ask questions that were more relevant for the program, um, the, the structure, the organization of the program. Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, um, uh, with my excuses. I have a very bad uh, uh, voice today, so despite a lot of tea. Uh, you'll see that uh, um, it's a bit strained, so apologies for this. So let me start uh, straight away. Um, I like to think about the meaning of Buddhist studies as a field of inquiry with you, and especially thinking about how we study Buddhism um, here at SOAS. Um, there are especially two um, aspects of this field that is important to take into account. One that is an interdisciplinary field, uh, which means that um, it's not a discipline itself, but can be approached from different disciplinary perspectives. Um, so you have Buddhist studies um, from a historical point of view, from a philosophical point of view, uh, textual criticism, uh, ritual studies, uh, art, and material culture. And many of these approaches are um, represented in one of the other modules that we teach, but often also within the same module to offer you a um, overview of the possibilities of learning about Buddhists. The second very important point is a critical approach, um, which means to look at Buddhism um, as an object to study and to look at how the study of Buddhism has developed um, through the centuries, not only in, in the West, in Europe, and uh, the rest of the Western world, but also in the places where Buddhism um, was originated and developed. And I'm particularly keen to highlight the, import, the importance of the input of Asian scholarship in shaping the field of Buddhist studies. Um, this is particularly relevant for me because the um, input of uh, uh, Japanese scholarship has been uh, foundational and one cannot really um, do Buddhist studies uh, um, without taking the, let's say, Asian perspective in, uh, um, into account. So these two uh, main methodological uh, questions have uh, uh, framed the way in which uh, uh, we learn about Buddhism at SOAS. Um, first of all, we are not a vocational um, department, we're not even a department of theology, so our uh, appreciation of Buddhism is that as a living religion um, that is rooted in specific cultural and political traditions. Um, the teaching is based on research on primary sources and first-hand knowledge of the field, which means that um, we are very sensitive and very um, much affected by um, the specific features that Buddhism has taken in its um, journey across Asia and in modern time beyond Asia. So what does this mean in practice? Um, these are some points that I think are 
um, important for us to reflect in terms of um, not only methodology, but also um, objects of attention. Buddhism is a very diverse religious tradition, historically and geographically. geographically. It is at the same time a transnational religion, a translational form of thought, a system of thought, as some people would say, and at the same time takes, um, um, uh, is characterized by uh, specific local uh, forms. This dynamic between uh, transnational and uh, local aspects has given uh, a race to ambiguities and sometimes contradictions, um, as if two different forms of Buddhism were uh, playing one against the other. So we speak about Buddhist studies and maybe in the mind of someone, uh, of some of you, or maybe people who come to the field from outside of it, uh, you think of Buddhism in the singular. The one thing that um, appears very quickly when you have a closer look at the sources of Buddhism and the practices of Buddhism is that we need to use uh, Buddhism in the plural to speak of Buddhisms, if we can say so. The multiplicity of uh, ideas and practices that make up Buddhism make it almost compulsory to look at the um, features of Buddhism, not only uh, the level of ideas, of philosophical outcomes, philosophical uh, thinking, uh, but also to look at what we can call the political issues of Buddhist societies, Buddhist cultures. And I use here political in a very uh, uh, broad sense, in the sense of, Lato of the word, um, including theories of liberation that we can consider uh, more strictly uh, belonging to the uh, you know, scholastic, doctrinal, uh, philosophical context, but also the engagement with the political world. Uh, Buddhism as a living religion has been uh, across history and still is in some country a state religion. So what does that mean for the way in which Buddhism has developed or Buddhist ideas have developed? Um, it, it's important to think about the agents of Buddhists mm -hmm. and uh, here the construction of gender, for instance, um, becomes fundamental and the understanding of, um, of the environment. So these are just some of the um, areas that um, show us uh, um, the diversity of Buddhism, uh, the diversity of the uh, products, uh, cultural products that we call today Buddhist, and um, the multiplicity of uh, methodologies that are necessary to um, understand each of these aspects of uh, the tradition. Um, now let me give uh, an example in more details, looking at a specific uh, topic um, within Buddhist studies um, that has uh, come perhaps more to the attention of scholars in, um, in recent times. And that is uh, um, how we can define the aims and the modes of Buddhist practice focusing on a, um, an element that is very uh, close to us and at the same time um, has been um, an object of, mu of much thinking by Buddhists across um, periods and geographical areas, and that is the body. So I like to think um, how we can articulate or how uh, we as I mean, re representing the Buddhist world in its multiplicity uh, can articulate uh, ideas of liberation. And with this term, I, um, I include in this term um, other 
uh, any aspect of, uh, um, of the outcome of Buddhist practice or the ideal of Buddhist uh, um, inspiration, aspiration that can be called enlightenment, can be called salvation, can be called uh, nirvana. So all these different expressions of, um, of the attainments that can be uh, achieved through Buddhist practice, I call liberation. Now we'd like to look at how um, these ideals of liberation have been articulated uh, by using a, um, an object such as the body, the human body, that presents itself as the opposite of uh, a liberated body, as a, presents itself as a transient entity that is uh, um, firmly rooted in time and place. So we can say that uh, um, the body in Buddhism has an ambiguous position uh, that stands at the crossroad of apparently contrasting conceptual stances. It is a finite entity, if you think of um, a body that is born and it dies, so it has a temporal uh, finitude, and um, at the same time, it is presented in some Buddhist sources, in many Buddhist sources in fact, as um, the object of that transformation of the uh, finite into the um, absolute, into the uh, non-finite, that is uh, the goal of Buddhism. So let's look at the diversity of these ideas of the body. And I will start with negative views of the body that we find in some tradition um, that reject the body as a symbol of the suffering of sentient beings. And these traditions draw attention to the physical constituents of the body that determine um, pain, not understood only in terms of, um, of physical pain, of individual pain, but in terms of karmic pain, um, all sorts of obstructions of that the body uh, poses to liberation and that are um, not that are not limited to the individual existence of uh, one body in one life but are um, are inherited by multiple existence that's what we uh, understand as, uh, um, as the karmic cycle so in other words the body is a symbol of suffering because it, uh, uh, incorporates, it uh, embodies, we could say, um, that chain of uh, birth and death, of life and death, that uh, Buddhism in its uh, um, very early expressions is um, um, it's set to um, overcome. So what uh, really makes uh, um, this entity, which we call body, um, problematic, is the fact that it embodies um, the duality of the world, the, um, the duality of uh, language. Um, it poses one body as different from another body. It poses a subject and a object, we would say in Western philosophical, terms as different and therefore dual, it, um, it brings uh, to the fore um, the oppositions between things, between elements of the world that we see around us, what is called in Buddhism the conventional world, or maybe we can say the phenomenal world, um, in all its uh, being, whether it's physical or whether it is um, um, rituals and the actions that the, the body um, performs. Um, 
So we can see that uh, sources that look at the body as something negative, and we have a great number of Indo-Tibetan sources that um, start the inquiry into the origin of human life by emphasizing the negativity of being born. Um, in these sources, uh, for instance, um, we will see represented the suffering of the fetus, so the origin of human life in very concrete terms, you could say. Um, and the fetus is represented as something that, uh, as an entity that is constrained by the fact of, uh, of, of growing in a place, the place of conception, the, the, the womb, the human, the, the female's womb, especially, uh, that is conceived as filthy, as, as dirty, and as narrow, and in other words, all those constraints that are both physical um, and, uh, and emotional, you could say. Um, so to, to be liberated in this context, um, to achieve um, enlightenment, Buddhahood, realization, again, the variety of terms of which liberation can be um, articulated, means to go out of the chain of uh, continuous rebirth, of continuous reincarnation into another fetus, if we speak about human reincarnation, or in other beings that are deemed to die. And that is what we call, what these traditions call um, nirvana. And uh, many sources that think uh, um, negatively about the body think of nirvana as something that happens, can happen only after, uh, after death. The ultimate attainment um, can happen after um, the constraints of the physical constraints of the human body have been left. Next to this, um, maybe represented better by um, the East Asian tradition, but not exclusively, but especially the East Asian tradition, we have a positive emphasis on the body as a site of salvation, as the uh, very expression of Buddhist attainment, and therefore the preeminent vehicle for overcoming the finitude that uh, characterizes it. So we see here a very different perspective that looks at the elimination of the chain of multiple rebirth, not in a future um, outside the uh, finitude of the world, but within the world itself. Um, and the ideal that these Buddhist communities pursue is attaining liberation now and here. So with the body that you have been endowed, let's say, they, and this is what they, how they express it, the flesh body that you have been given by mother and father. Um, one expression that very often is understood to represent these ideas, um, comes from, uh, from East Asian traditions and uh, says attaining Buddhahood with one's own body. So that the multiplicity of rebirth um, is, let's say, almost dismissed, um, is there um, as a foundation of, of Buddhist thinking, but is not relevant anymore. So what happens in a system that thinks that the body as it is, as a finite, um, can be uh, the ultimate expression of Buddhist attainment. Just because the body is understood as this liminal space, this one liminal in the sense that it exists um, on the border between what I've called here in Western terms, time and eternity, um, finite um, time and infinite time, we could say. Um, the concept of, of eternity is expressed uh, maybe slightly different than it is expressed in, in um, 
uh, Western sources uh, uh, when we speak about Buddhist uh, expressions. But anyway, just, just let's think of, um, um, of the body as this liminal space. This exactly this liminal space that uh, allows um, the body to become a site of transformation. So Buddhist uh, sources that engage the body in these terms, um, interestingly, highlight both its duality, so fact, all those dual aspects that I mentioned earlier on, but also the contiguity between the two conditions that the body is assumed, the temporal uh, condition and the potential for a uh, infinite, absolute um, dimension. So in this case, practices of the body, practices that have the body at its center, are meant to resolve the duality that it embodies and to resolve them virtually by performative actions that allow the practitioner, um, practitioner being used as a general term for a Buddhist, uh, let's say Buddhist follower who is practicing Buddhism, right? Um, that aim to transform the ordinary being into the uh, thus come the Tathagata, the, the, the Buddha. Um, so we can say that um, this finite body of human beings, in this case, the practitioners, managed to actualize in itself that condition of non-duality that is considered the ultimate goal of Buddhist practice. And this means that Buddhahood, um, that is the essence of the aim, very aim of, of Buddhists, so the being of the Buddha, Buddhahood in that sense, um, is articulated as a cognitive process that passes through the body. And this is quite interesting when the body, you think of the body in Western terms, um, you think immediately of the opposition between body and mind, between physical characteristics and mental processes. But what happens in the systems so that uh, speak of the body in more absolute terms, if I'm allowed this uh, expression, is that um, the mental functions and the physical characteristics of the body are joined, are always um, interacting and cannot exist one without the other. And um, this is really an important uh, um, way that is underpinned, a way of thinking about the body that is underpinned by a specific conception of reality and by the very understanding of what the form of the Buddha is. If we can say, say what are the bodies of the Buddha? And what are the possibilities, the potentialities of sentient and even non-sentient beings? Uh, non-sentient beings are those who, um, who do not speak, we could say, who do not think, who do not feel, so who traditionally would be said who have no uh, mental functions, um, how also these um, beings um, can be understood as part of the Buddhist world. So in other words, the, 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 these ideas of these positive ideas of the body as an entity that, um, intrinsically is endowed with the potential and the possibility to achieve a condition that is that of the Buddha um, need to be related to um, a you know, 
metaphysical, if we want to use philosophical terms from the Western context, a metaphysical um, and even perhaps an ontological understanding of reality in which the Buddha is not a separate being from um, human beings, but um, it is perhaps partaking of the duality of human beings in the say, and because of that, um, sentient beings, I, I prefer to use sentient beings because that's what the, the text to use, uh, the Buddhists think of, about rather than uh, simple human beings. Um, so sentient beings, in the same way, partake of the non-duality of the Buddha. So these are uh, very complex uh, um, concepts. We can't go to each of these things, but I thought I will uh, give you an example in practice. Um, how can, what kind of ritual can transform the body into, the, the practitioner's body into a uh, Buddha body? And I thought I would take uh, an example, we have two actually, but let's start with one. Um, an example from um, archival material that has been discovered recently in, uh, um, in temple archives, medieval Japanese temple archives. Um, that I happen to have worked um, uh, more closely on. And it is interesting because uh, um, it's uh, not only a, um, uh, these are not only treatises, um, so philosophical articulations of this concept, but are uh, illustrated uh, by diagrams, uh, by sketches, by more properly uh, colored images, that uh, um, give you much more the, um, the concrete sense of what was happening, how, how these ideas were applied to, uh, to, to, to practice, to concrete practice. And, um, and these are uh, visualization practices um, that were aimed at recreating the body of the practitioner as the body of a Buddha. In this case, in the case of this, um, uh, work that I, I, I've, uh, I've put here, this little uh, uh, diagram that I put here on the screen. Um, we're talking of a Buddha who is not the historical Buddha, but is one of the many Buddhas uh, that were um, that were created in uh, um, in uh, the the uh, branch of Buddhism that is called Mahayana Buddhism, and this Buddha is called the Mahavarochana in Sanskrit. Um, um, Dainichi in Japanese, so it's a, it's a Buddha that is characterized, that, that is kind of the protagonist, you could say, the, 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 um, uh, the center of uh, um, tantric systems. And what happens in, uh, in these practices is that the, um, the practitioner um, with his mind, with his um, mouth, so with his voice and with gestures, um, visualizes, utters the names of Buddhas that constitute a mandalic body, the body of the Buddha represented as a mandala, so multiple, let's say, a mandala is a, is a kind of cosmogram made of different entities. So, so the, the, that, if that represents the Buddha body, that is a, a multiple body um, or a body that incorporates multiplicity, we could say. So in this visualization practices, um, the practitioner um, concentrate on the names, the uh, images of these deities and um, visualizes them on specific parts of his own body. In other words, mark, the practitioner marks his own body by inscribing it with letters, with deities. And in so doing, in a ritual context, transform it into the body of the mandala. And this body is defined the body that is so from the origins. In other words, not the body that is born, that has entered the chain of life and death, but the body of the Buddha that is ever 
that is forever, that has always been, that is um, the expression in uh, Buddhism is uh, very often, that has no beginning and no end. And I'd like to show you another example very quickly in which uh, um, the um, physicality of the human body uh, is used as uh, a model for uh, conceiving of the practices of transformation into non-dual beings, that is in a Buddha-like existence. And this is another diagram, um, again, from another archive. Uh, um, and uh, these are mostly 13th century uh, images that you see here. And in this case, um, these five forms that we see here, um, very strange forms here, um, that end up with the, with the aspect of a Buddha, of a, of a Buddha sitting in meditation, um, are meant to represent the process of gestation of a sentient being. And the, you know, the glosses here will say really that there is a moment in which the fluids of mother and father encounter each other, and that produces a being that grows little by little, with you know, you have two forms, and here you have like the arms and the head, and then becomes becomes this, this image here is a stupa, stupa of five elements, it's called, which means that the body is endowed of all the physical constituents of the universe. So it's a complete body. But that body then at the moment of being um, released from the mother's womb, so the, the moment of being born is in the shape of a Buddha. In other words, what is conceived in, uh, uh, in this womb that in other tradition were, were, was considered filthy and was considered something to get out as soon as possible becomes the moment of the transformation, the place of the transformation of the uh, dualistic existence of, uh, um, of the practitioner into the non-dual perfected body of a Buddha. But all this happens, uh, or at least is conceived to happen within the um, the, 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 body, the physical limited body of the practitioner himself. So duality is at the same time acknowledged and continuously overcome. And another, it is interesting that by um, looking at these kind of, um, of charts, of, of diagrams, of, uh, the, um, of the practice of transformation, of the Buddhist uh, practitioner as a process of gestation, um, is it interesting to see how much of knowledge that you wouldn't call uh, exactly Buddhist, so that it doesn't come from um, um, an articulation of what is the teaching of the Buddha, um, is inserted and is reused. So in fact, um, in order to explain the, um, the, the, the development of a practitioner, um, these texts use a lot of medical knowledge that uh, was being uh, uh, created. This is actually medical uh, knowledge uh, um, uh, transmitted uh, from India uh, throughout uh, the, the Asian continent um, through Buddhist texts. So again, we see the extent to which um, the articulation of the aim of Buddhist liberation can take different shapes depending on the cultural context in which these, things, these ideas are developed and um, in relation to systems of knowledge that um, seem to be uh, external to Buddhist proper. I think I will stop here. I've taken a little bit more time than I should have probably. Um, and maybe I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, questions, if any, um, and then maybe have a bit of time to speak about the program. Thank you. Any question, any comment? that you want to have? Was it maybe a little bit cryptic kind of introduction to Buddhism? 
Anyone? Oh, yes, I see that there is a question here from Rami Roa. Yes. Are you saying that Buddhism is cultural relative? Um, Buddhism in Sri Lanka's cultural different to Buddhism in Tibet. Yes, I am saying that. Um, absolutely. Um, there are differences that are due to the type of Buddhism. So there's not just Buddhism, but there are types of Buddhism that developed uh, um, historically. So just taking an example from the two traditions you are uh, mentioning here. Um, uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism is uh, um, uh, mainly uh, represented by what we call, uh, we call it in different ways, again, uh, politically sensitive terminology, uh, Theravada, what has been called Theravada Buddhism or, or early Buddhism, um, whereas Tibetan Buddhism is mainly Mahayana Buddhism. So these are the two largest um, um, types of Buddhas. But I, what I wanted to say is that the uh, differences are even more subtle, that even within the Mahayana uh, context, for instance, that is the context I was talking about, you have very different uh, ideas of what is liberation and how to achieve it. And you have an incredible variety of expression, uh, expressions to indicate certain um, aims. Another question here that says, do you think, uh, by, uh, the question is from Grace, do you think there is a, a change in the views of women and their place in Buddhism dependent on the branch of Buddhism beliefs of whether birth is positive or a negative process or does this viewpoint concerning the womb not extend to women as individuals? Uh, this is a very interesting question and is uh, um, a question that uh, uh, I've actually even uh, addressed in, in this work of mine I was uh, uh, drawing from. Um, there are, um, the, so the specific kind of concentration rituals, the uh, visualization ritual I was talking about, seem to me to use uh, uh, women as uh, uh, more a um, focus to uh, represent duality, so the opposite. Um, of, of male, you could say more as, uh, um, as, uh, as a sort of uh, polarity, polarities. But, um, but there are different, uh, but, but when we speak about uh, um, views of women in Buddhism, that, that is, um, um, that is a, a very large topic that uh, um, embraces partly what I was uh, uh, quoting, for instance, uh, the polluting um, dimension of the womb and especially of uh, the act of being born, um, the bloody affair of being born. Uh, that is a very important uh, aspect of the, we can say the biological um, nature of women that uh, is taken, was taken over um, in Buddhism as an element of discrimination, of, uh, uh, we could say even biological discrimination, but which will become later on even ritual discrimination. Uh, so for instance, uh, um, traditionally, uh, well, again, to give you an example uh, that I know better than others, uh, like in, in Japanese uh, uh, narratives, uh, you will, uh, um, you will uh, very often read that, um, um, that women who are polluting should not enter the sacred presence of, uh, uh, of temples. And uh, uh, still today, some sacred mountains are um, 
well, are forbidden to women, uh, if you think of them uh, in, ritual, uh, in ritual terms, uh, the, the, the access to the uh, innermost san uh, sacred areas is uh, um, um, considered to be too sacred for uh, beings such as women who are, um, uh, who have in hindrances, this is the term that is used in Buddhism, that may be connected just to, to their biological being. Um, so again, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, large topic and uh, uh, we can think about what women do, um, what they've done it throughout history, what they do in different places to counteract these ideas. Um, women, in particular Buddhist women, but women who are interested in uh, um, maintaining their uh, identity as Buddhist, and at the same time, um, you know, being seen um, maybe as, as even as equal uh, beings. Um, uh, there is an interesting, very interesting uh, um, movement of uh, uh, feminist Buddhists, uh, both in the West and in Asia, that interprets in different ways um, both the, you can say, the canonical statements of the scriptures. Uh, with regard to the inferiority of women and the um, historical practices of women and even uh, more broadly um, Buddhist communities, monastic and lay communities um, to overcome that, um, well, those statements, let's, let's say. Um, so there's a follow-up then from uh, Rami that says, uh, if Buddhism in general preaches modesty, how come there are monuments and grandiose display of worship of the Buddha across Asia, like the gold statues of him? Doesn't that defeat the purpose of Buddhism as a whole? Um, I'm not sure that, uh, um, again, you speak of Buddhism in the singular. Uh, where is Buddhism preaching modesty? Uh, if you think that the historical development of Buddhism depended on um, the sponsorship of, uh, of the elites, we could say, and even of, uh, of rulers, and the fact that Buddhism always uh, provided um, legitimation to you know, political power and often social order, then it's very difficult to think that Buddhism is about modesty I mean, I'm not sure what you mean about it, but, um, but certainly um, something like monuments, displays of worship um, or, or golden statues do not defeat the purpose of Buddhism, but they um, open up the, um, you know, the wealth of Buddhism, we could say. The, uh, um, they open up the possibility of uh, um, identifying um, with the Buddhas, uh, for instance, the Buddha uh, represented in, is represented in sutras, the, especially Mahayana uh, Buddhas are represented as, uh, uh, well, in the cent uh, at the center of assemblies made of different beings. And that was a very, um, a very useful symbols of a universal sovereign that could be taken over by rulers who uh, became Buddhist, who um, helped the spread of Buddhism, but also used the Buddhism um, to legitimize their own authority. So I think, uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I don't know where your question comes from, but it seems to be a very idealistic uh, um, feeling of Buddhism that uh, seems to dismiss the fact that Buddhism was a um, religion and is a religion in many countries and uh, therefore um, has very mm, important social aspects. Um, yeah, I should go, there are three more questions and we have very little time. Um, uh, Yang, uh, Yang Tiang, uh, Chen or Chen, I don't know, uh, three names here, uh, asks, uh, uh, there is an old saying in China, uh, like Buddhism is like water, while different cultures are like bowls with different shape. 
It is like put the water in different bottles. So the water is still the water, but it is in different shapes. Um, thank you. That's a fantastic symbol. That's, um, well, the shape of water is a, a trope in many cultures, maybe we can say. Um, but there is another saying in East Asia that is about the, the waves and the ocean. It says that the ocean is one, but waves are all different one from the other. And they, uh, cla they, they, they go get ashore or clash against the rocks in different ways, producing different shapes. And yet the water is always the same. So yes, Buddhism is, uh, th th there is a core, there are um, a number of Buddhist tenets, maybe we can call it, and even practices that are, um, uh, that are there across different expressions, but, um, but the, we, we cannot forget the expressions, the individual, the um, historically and cultural determined expressions of uh, um, a religion and system of thought that after all is made of individuals who were different in historical periods and in um, and in geographical areas. So the uh, idealistic representation of Buddhism in the singular is uh, something that has been preached by you know, the historical Buddha, the, the Buddha that we call Shakyamuni, um, is a pretty limited view of what Buddhism was and uh, what was across a very large um, expanse of territory that is, uh, that is Asia and um, in modern times outside Asia as well. Um, Grace says, thank you for answering my question. It was an interesting lecture. And I'm intrigued to look to, to this more as a translation student. Now, this is really interesting. We have this here in the MA uh, Buddhist Studies, uh, a, a student from China who is uh, uh, also interested uh, in uh, translation theories and has been applying um, translation theories to the a way in which we engage with Buddhist text, which is a field that still needs a lot of uh, a lot of attention. Um, okay, thank you, Rami, for asking your questions. And many people seem to be um, have to leave. Well, some people seem to be have to leave here. So maybe we should stop here. Um, and if you have any questions about the program. Uh, that I had hoped to, to find some time to, to, to speak about you, please do not hesitate to come back um, to me by email. Um, most of the information you have, you, you would like to have is uh, uh, on our website, but um, do feel free to, um, to email me.